Some of the hardest problems in the world exist far above the planet. Our job, to launch the smartest solutions, to protect our satellites, clean up our clutter, to propel breakthroughs in propulsion, to learn more about our place in the universe, to outpace emerging threats. Every day, the Aerospace Corporation uses the latest technologies to ensure our nation's safety and leadership in space. Hi, and welcome to the Space Policy Show. I'm your host, Rebecca Rose. As always, you can find us on Twitter using hashtag the Space Policy Show, and you can engage with our experts on Vimeo using the chat box. We would also like it if you would sign up for our latest news and alerts at aerospace.org slash policy. Today's episode is on NASA and space nuclear propulsion. Invigorated by new Mars missions for humans and the 2020 national space policy, nuclear propulsion in space is getting a lot of attention lately. In today's episode, we have aerospace expert Greg Mahalik talking with NASA's Michael Houts. Greg Mahalik is a senior project leader for the Aerospace Corporation, covering launch and propulsion technology concept development for the Civil Systems Group. Michael Houts is a nuclear research manager at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, where he advises on research and development related to the design, development, and use of space nuclear power and propulsion systems. In 2020, he received NASA's Distinguished Service Medal. Welcome and over to Greg to get us started. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, so Mike and I have known each other for actually quite a number of years. Uh, we're yeah. together on the same uh, committee for the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And the committee is called the Nuclear and Future Flight Propulsion Technical Committee. And it's actually a fantastic committee and community of people that have all been associated with the interests of nuclear propulsion and power, as well as other interesting things like fusion and antimatter and warp drive and a variety of other things. And after so many years of being on those committees together and just having, you know, interactions at conferences and whatnot with Mike, it turns out that him and I are both working on a common project together that actually he's a huge part of uh, at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center on the space nuclear propulsion side of things to try to make that a reality. So, Mike, I just want to say thank you for taking the time today to come and be on the on the show for us. And I appreciate um, it. No, thank, and, thanks for having me, Greg. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's a great, great topic to discuss. Yeah, yeah, it should be it should be fun since we've both been you know toying with this stuff for twenty years, right? And yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and you're yeah. definitely in the thick of it with the project you have. Um, so I just wanted to ask, um, you know, as kind of a lead off question because some of the audience members may not know what nuclear propulsion or power are, but what is? How would you describe it in just a couple of sentences as far as like nuclear propulsion and nuclear power? And why would we want to use that? Why is NASA interested in nuclear propulsion? And I'll just stick to that one for now. Why is NASA interested in nuclear propulsion for uh, things like sending crew and cargo to Mars? Okay. Well, yeah. So what uh, space nuclear power and propulsion really buys us is a, uh, it's a virtually an unlimited energy density. And what I mean by that is the, just the standard fission reaction has tens of millions of times the uh, energy density that you get in a chemical reaction. And, and so what that does is it opens up a lot of potential opportunities. You have, you know, for example, for a nuclear thermal propulsion system, we're just using the energy from fission to heat the propellant. And so the energy is actually coming from fission, but that allows us to use any propellant that we want to use because we don't need a, a chemical reaction to provide the energy for the propellant. So for example, with the kind of the first generation or the traditional nuclear thermal propulsion systems, we'll be using hydrogen as our propellant because of the low molecular weight. And the, the combination of the, the energy from fission, the ability to use hydrogen and, and going to some pretty high temperatures, probably about 2,700 Kelvin, uh, we can get a specific impulse about twice that of your best chemical system. So that's twice the efficiency. Uh, that opens up a lot of mission opportunities. Uh, down the road, uh, if we uh, move to systems, uh, not necessarily using a solid fuel form, there have been liquid fueled nuclear reactors built in the past. If we extrapolate that to a nuclear thermal propulsion system, uh, now we're talking maybe getting specific impulses of say 1800 seconds. And again, being able to use really any propellant we want to, that'd be 1800 seconds with hydrogen, but maybe 900 seconds with ammonia or methane. 
And so that's kind of the next level. And then you go beyond that, there's even some concepts that have been proposed where we go ahead and use the fuel in a, in a gaseous form and get even higher specific impulses. So it's kind of a, uh, just going down the path of space nuclear power propulsion, going down that route, it's uh, because of that energy density in the uranium and because of the ability, uh, again, to use that as your energy source and not have to rely on the chemical reactions, gives us the ability to have some, some very advanced systems. It's really getting us on a kind of a whole new pathway. And, and likewise, that same energy density, we can apply that to power systems as well. And so, uh, you know, a fission surface power system on the surface of the moon or advanced reactor for powering electric thrusters, uh, you know, near-term thrusters, you know, further-term thrusters, all those uh, become options once we get on that development path. Yeah, and it's uh, the way that we've been describing it also to, you know, layman level uh, folks is that it's basically a different way of producing heat, right? It's nuclear fission heat, and yeah, you can yeah. capture that heat by either passing a propellant through it and sending it out a nozzle like you would in a conventional rocket engine, or you use that heat to transfer into some other working fluid, which you extract the power out of using some other possibly mechanical means like a generator. And so you have a, a nuclear power plant in space, right? And so there's right, the, yeah, that's exactly, the nuclear yeah. propulsion. Yeah. And then that power can be used to run typical electric thrusters or, or other subsystems. So I think one of the main concerns also is, okay, you know, for from the 1960s, we had the program called NERVA Rover, right? Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle Applications, I think, is what NERVA stood for, right? And they actually did right. test several nuclear rocket, nuclear, uh, nuclear rocket engines, but on the ground out in the middle of Nevada. And, um, you know, that had a different type of reactor design, it went, you know, sort of. I guess there's a, can there's a handful of ways of designing the actual reactor. Right. Yeah. But it was uranium powered, right? I mean, all of these are uranium powered. So I guess, um, you know, to ask, what, what is NASA looking at right now for the Space Nuclear Propulsion Project? What kind of fuels, fuel forms, and in, in the term fuel for this type of engine, the fuel is the uranium, right? The propellant is the hydrogen which is different right. than what we call fuel in rocket engines, which is typically yeah, yeah, hydrogen yeah. or kerosene, like in a chemical base. So anyway, the term fuel that we're going to be using through the discussion is typically relating to the uranium, right, throughout uh -huh. throughout this uh, the show. But so what kind of fuel forms, I guess, you know, uranium processing, uranium forms, is NASA looking at that are different uh, than, than NERVA? Are they the same? Uh, does it allow these nuclear thermal propulsion systems of today you know, 50 years, 60 years later to be more, you know, more efficient, better performing or more safe. Right. And I know the safe thing is a, is a big deal from a launch perspective as well as an, on in, in orbit operation. So can you talk a little bit about the fuel forms? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're building uh, there's a, a somewhat of a resurgence in nuclear technology around the world, interest in nuclear technology. And so one of the things uh, we're looking at, first of all, we're, we're looking at systems that can use high assay, low enriched uranium. And essentially what that means, this is fuel that's going to be used uh, in commercial power plants. It's, it's, you know, prolif very proliferation resistant, uh, but that's good. These are uh, small modular reactors, small power plants that really are being envisioned for uh, use around the world. They, uh, uh, of course, they're a clean source of energy. They don't emit CO2. And so with that, uh, with those uh, types of reactors, we're going to really build on a lot of the technologies that are, being developed for the terrestrial systems. And so that's not just the fuel forms, but uh, there's components they call a neutron moderator that uh, allows the system to run, uh, typically run better when we're using uh, high assay, low enriched uranium. A lot of the uh, neutron reflectors, control systems, many of those things will have a lot of similarity. And so uh, and so then within that, we do have a lot of, a lot of really good choices for fuel forms. There's been a lot of development work uh, with the fuels. I'll give one example. There's engineered uh, coated particles and those were actually the the first use of coated particle fuel was actually in the rover nerva program and so then the experience we had from that program that actually led uh, to the development of a, a very uh, successful fuel form as uh, basically it's a triso particle is the the you know technical name for it but it's really just again an engineered coated particle we have a, a a particle fuel and then there's various coatings put on that fuel to allow it to perform mm -hmm. well to be uh, extremely safe, very, uh, some extremely and safe. The, yeah, these, partic 
Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. These particles are microns across, right? They're not like a. I mean, the, the overall particle is a. You know. Oh yeah. What like 850, 500 microns, and inside of the center of that is this tiny little, tiny little grain of uranium, and then right. wrapped with all these protective coatings. Is that yeah? Is it, that's the triso, right? Trilayer isotropic, I think is what. That's exactly. Called. Yeah. The the uh, particle itself, and it can be ur uranium nitride. It can be uranium dioxide. It can be uranium carbide. So a lot of a lot of options for that. Uh, specific form. And then uh, it can have uh, coatings, uh, say for very high temperature applications, a uh, zirconium carbide coating is very useful. The uh, For terrestrial applications, uh, silicon carbide coatings have been used, but you're, you're absolutely right. The particles themselves may be somewhere between 150 microns up to 800 microns for the fuel kernel itself. And then just a, a series of layers that really help uh, both with the safety and the performance of those particles. And that's just one fuel form. There's many other fuel forms also, but what's what's good is these fuel forms are being explored for use in, with terrestrial systems. And so there's a lot of uh, applicability to uh, space nuclear power propulsion. For example, the engineered coated particles. Again, a lot of the recent development work really has been focused on small terrestrial reactors. We can build on that, build on the expertise, build on the capability to really engineer these particles to allow us to have very effective fuel, very useful fuels for the space nuclear power propulsion systems. Yeah, I think those also came from um, at least the past, you know, 15, 20 years of fuel development for accident tolerant fuels, even for terrestrial yeah. power plants, right? Um, exactly. Because, yeah. One of, the yeah problems, of, uh, one of the problems I understood from Nerva was that that they actually they just basically had particles like chips of uranium embedded into a graphite moderator, right? And so there were there were thermal issues in the engine where some of that uranium mm -hmm was actually exposed into the exhaust stream, uh, which is not really a good thing when you're open air testing in Nevada. But with these accident tolerant fuels, the exposure of the uranium, actual uranium grain is, is much more unlikely, I guess. I mean, it can happen obviously, but it's much more protected. So it's quote yeah, they, safer, they've had a, right? Yeah, just tremendous uh, success developing them for terrestrial applications. There's a, a reactor out at Idaho National Lab. It's the advanced test reactor where they did a, a, you know, just irradiated hundreds of thousands of these particles and show that they performed very well at the, uh, again, like you said, the, the conditions that they wanted them to be able to perform at for the accident tolerant fuel application. Uh, but building on that expertise, just the uh, really the, the knowledge of how those particles behave and the ability to engineer the coatings. We can uh, put very high quality coatings on those particles now and um, you know very good control of that process. That's just, again, just one example of a fuel form that uh, has developed a lot since the Rover Nerva program and, and could be useful. There's also uh, a lot of work that was done, the uh, Space Nuclear Thermal Propulsion Program back in the early 90s. And those were uh, some fuels developed mm -hmm. there. A lot of them were building on this, the idea of having the particulate fuel uh, but looking at fuel forms that go to extremely high temperatures with a, a lot of advances, not only during the uh, Rover Nerva program, but also in the Space Nuclear Thermal Propulsion program back from the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. And uh, so like moving into that, since you just talked about the, uh -huh. the historical program, can you give us a few words about um, the current project? Right. From from what I remember back in it was about 2016. Uh -huh. And I had the, the pleasure of actually sitting in on the kickoff meeting for this at NASA Marshall uh -huh. by, by phone because I was I was uh, on vacation at the time, actually. But um, there were a whole bunch of different uh, organizations involved, different NASA centers uh, to talk about this. Um, you know, they didn't call it space nuclear thermal or space nuclear propulsion at the time. I think it was just, hey, you know, do we have a project to build a nuclear thermal rocket? Right. Uh -huh. And, yep. um, uh, you know, that was kind of the history for it. And, and Aerospace Corporation was involved at the fringe ends of that project, looking at some costing and some schedule and program um, uh, program planning and things like that, just to kind of do some preliminary assessments. But we've actually gotten a lot more technically involved ever since about 2018. But I was wondering if you could say a few words about, you know, what NASA has done between NERVA and, and this current project and what they're doing in the current project, as far as what the status is right now, like what kind of things are going on with the development of the space nuclear propulsion system. Okay, well, we're really looking at uh, you know everything kind of across the board. Uh, looking at again, the fuels is the focus of the program, and so when we're developing the fuels, we have uh, several test facilities that we use. We basically fabricate uh, segments of the fuel, or, or you know, 
you know, of various lengths to start, you know, working out the details of the fuel. And that, of course, demonstrates the fabrication of fuel uh, and then the ability for that fuel to operate in a high temperature environment and then also in a nuclear mm -hmm. environment. And so for the fuels uh, we're using, uh, there's two uh, systems or, or, you know, piece of equipment that we use at Marshall. It's the uh, compact fuel element environmental tester, the CFEET system. And then we also use entries, nuclear thermal rocket element environmental simulator. And what those systems do is they allow us to expose everything from a, a small sample of fuel up to a full length fuel element to, to hot hydrogen. And that's hydrogen up in the you know 2700 Kelvin range, kind of in the range that we'd be operating the the kind of the traditional NTP engines at. And so, but that's a, it's a non-nuclear test. And so then we, when we finish with those tests, uh, then we have uh, two options that we're using for nuclear testing. We're using the uh, Idaho National Lab has the TREAT reactor. It's a, a transient reactor that lets us simulate the very fast startup of a, you know, of a nuclear rocket. Typically we try to start in 30 to 60 seconds. And so, uh, but that's a, a reactor that's excellent capability allows us to do that. And then also doing some testing at the MIT reactor, the MITR uh, up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so, so that's kind of our, the fuels aspect. It's a combination of the, the fabrication of the, the fuel and the, you know, the fuel segments and then the testing both non-nuclear and nuclear. But uh, beyond that, we're also looking at really all other aspects of the system. We're doing a lot of uh, modeling, engine modeling, to make sure that the mm -hmm. the uh, you know the integrated engine uh, works the way you know that uh, you know needs to. We have the right heat balances, and then of course looking at the various uh, components within the system. We mentioned the uh, moderators uh, for the neutrons. Turns out again for the high assay, low enriched uranium system, uh, do have better performance if they use what they call a neutron moderator uh, within the system. And so we're looking at that. And then uh, uh, some of the neutron reflector components, uh, structural support. So really uh, kind of across the board, but the, the focus of the, the current program is on fuels. And I should mention, we're also partnering with other agencies. There is uh, DARPA has a project called uh, Draco that's also very uh, interested in, in trying to do a, a flight demonstration in the, the very near term, uh, hope, hopefully around uh, 2025. And so we also have some good, good partnerships with other agencies within the government. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. That was going to be one of my next questions is what okay. other agencies okay. is NASA working with or kind of alongside or feeding from or feeding to uh, some of the, you know, all the great work that uh, has been done uh -huh. on this project since 2016. And we're familiar, obviously, with the Draco one. And there's also AFRL has some some interests and, and, and so forth. Uh -huh. So it's it's really good to hear that you know, nuclear isn't 20 years away anymore, right? Like it used to be, right? It used to be that it was always, you know, oh, that's, yeah. that's science fiction and we'll never get there. Oh, or we did that in, back in the Nerva days. Yeah. But now with the advent of new modeling techniques, new materials, new fuel forms, um, uh -huh. you know, new manufacturing techniques, you know, it's really amazing and fantastic to see that finally it's kind of coming of age in addition to the need for these kinds of things, right? That, you know, there's a there's a there's a recognized need now that people are starting to see that, you know, we can't just be flying around space with chemical, you know, hydrogen, methane, and oxygen systems, you know, by propellants, if you will, you know, for a conventional mm -hmm. rocket engine, because that's only going to get us so far. Uh, but there's these other missions, these other opportunities um, that we can only do with something that's a, you know, a game changer, you know, twice, you know, 200, a hundred percent more efficiency, right. Was, yeah, was yeah, essentially yeah. what a nuclear engine offers over chemical, which is kind of crazy to think, right. A hundred percent more. Uh -huh. um, but, um, but yeah, there, there was the other agencies you mentioned as far as, uh, you know, what, what, uh, who NASA are working with, who else is part of the project as far as, uh, you know, other agencies okay, okay. that might be helping out some of the technical innovations, technical research, technical aspects from, from your side. Right. Well, of course, we have very uh, strong partnership with the Department of Energy, uh, working uh, with uh, Idaho National Lab, Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, uh, Los Alamos National Lab, Argonne, uh, others. And so we have uh, you know, very good uh, partnerships with the Department of Energy. A lot of industry involvement. We're getting some uh, you know, just uh, really uh, fantastic interactions with industry. Uh, like I said, there are there is interest and uh, growing interest in nuclear technology really across the board. And so a lot of uh, great work going on with industry and then also with universities. It's um, uh, there is a need for uh, nuclear engineers. There is a need for you know people that are working in the field of nuclear technology. Uh, again, just based on a lot of the growth in the terrestrial interest. And so, it's uh, space nuclear power propulsion is a really fun area to work in. And so, it's a lot of students get very excited about. It. There's also a lot of really good work 
uh, some of our more, uh, I'll, I'll just say one some of our more advanced systems, uh, we like them because of the performance capability it could give us. But you talk to these professors and they actually like them because they just see a hundred different thesis topics. You know, and so it's kind of, it's kind of fun. I mean, you, you uh, um, and so we'd, we'd love for them to succeed. They'd obviously love to succeed. And so it's, uh, uh, so we have a lot of work in those areas. And, and you know, I should mention just going back, you know, what you, you first mentioned is, yeah, you know, they're really with fission, the, the physics is simple. I mean, it's literally you put the right materials in the right geometry and it turns on. And so that's why, mm -hmm. you know, soon after fission was discovered, discovered very soon, we were having self-sustaining chain reactions. And so, so we've known the physics for a really long time. It's probably, uh, oh, like coming, coming up close to 80 years now, since we've you know, really known the, uh, the physics involved with fission, but it's the engineering, you know, we need, you need to have good engineering. I mean, you know, soon after fission was discovered, sometimes you'll, you know, they hear the, the quotes about how oh, the uh, it's going to be too cheap to meter, uh, meaning electricity from nuclear power plants. Well, what, what they meant was it's so simple. I mean, it's literally you just put the right materials in the right geometry and it turns on. But it's that it's the engineering. Mm -hmm. It's the you know getting the, re the reliability, making sure, of course, the systems are, are safe, uh, making sure they have uh, performance. And then there's always the, the engineer's temptation about, you know, Oh, yeah. Not to not to paraphrase, you know, some of the robber barons when they'd ask them, well, how much how much money is enough? And they'd always say one dollar more. Uh, well, you know, engineers kind of do the same thing. Well, how much performance is good enough? And it's always, well, just a little bit more. You know, and so it's uh, so we have to avoid that yeah. temptation when we're working okay. with it also. But it's uh, uh, but yeah, it's uh, a lot of people involved, uh, a lot of really, uh, you know, again, really exciting project. And we're, I think we're making really good progress. Yeah, I, I agree. It's really a pleasure to be part of that crew working with NASA Marshall um, on, on a lot of these technical things. And, you know, we aerospace have been uh, primarily focused on looking at what would the first flight of a nuclear engine look like? What would the launch vehicle uh -huh. configuration, what are the options there? What could you launch it on? Um, you know, we've, we've done a lot of different uh, studies and, 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 and uh, trades on where could you process this at, at, a, at a launch site, those types of things. So um, you actually gave a, a really good presentation uh, recently on some of the um, launch approval processes uh, that are needed for these types oh, of okay. things. Uh, even referencing a lot of RTGs, you know, like you know the the the, the nuclear systems that power Cassini and powered uh, you know Galileo and those things. And those are very different, right? Those are radioisotope oh. thermal generators, which is like a natural decay of plutonium rather than like a fissioning active system, right? As far as I know. Right. Um, and um, so could you say a little bit about some of the, uh, you know, launch approval, who's responsible, who makes sure that the, that the studies have been done to say that it's safe to launch, um, uh -huh. you know, any policies that you might've heard come down to that, that need to, that need to be addressed regarding yeah. safety and on orbit. And I guess just to, to caveat, to say to the rest of the audience, you know, a lot of the, almost all of these, nuclear systems that we're talking about, Mike and I, are intended for in-space operations, right? They're not intended to send boosters from the launch pad into right. space, although that was considered back in the 60s, <laughs> you know, the 250,000 yeah, oh yeah, yeah. pound thrust engines. Um, but everything that we're dealing with now um, is in-space propulsion or in-space power, you know, that kind of thing. I'm sorry for that that diversion, but yeah, see if, what can you talk about with respect to policies and launch approval and safety and you know, being able to assure the public that when one of these things is sitting on the pad, ready to go for launch, even at a test flight, that, you know, that, that, that they are, you know, warm and comfy on that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I would say if anybody's interested, there's two uh, uh, recent updates to the launch approval policy. One would be the NSPM 20, uh, and that was uh, signed back, and I think it's August of 2019. And then uh, just December of 2020, mm -hmm. it was uh, called SPD six, so that's NSPM twenty mm -hmm. and SPD six, and the um, what what's good about both of those is that it's a very uh, quantitative approach, and so you look at the uh, you know for example just you know existing you know standards across the industry, and then try to quantify that you know relative to you know say the launch of a nuclear system, and so what they'll say is there's a you know, like a probability and a dose, and this is where in other words, there's a, uh, it has to be less than a certain probability of, of having a certain, you know, dose result from, you know, just from the overall mission. Now, that's mm -hmm. uh, with fission systems, with any kind of reactor, that always uh, becomes a, a tricky topic to discuss because it's not, you know, you know, it's not like, you know, if you say something weighs 10 pounds, 
uh, well, everybody knows, okay, or eight pounds, everybody knows, okay, that's about a gallon of milk. You know, so they, you know, you kind of get a feel for, you know, people just have a general feel, but when you say, oh, that's a millirem of dose, well, no one knows if that's horrible or, or benign. And so, I mean, it just, you don't have a gut feel for it. So uh, that's something that's, it's really good about these policies. Um, you know, the new, uh, um, yeah, just the, the, the memorandums and the uh, directives. Uh, it's because they try to quantify that. And so uh, I'd encourage people to look at those, but it's uh, it's good because it's a very, uh, again, it's a risk, it's a risk or probability consequence based approach. And you'll see numbers in there. Uh, one of the ones I like to mention is, so when we fly, for example, uh, we get an extra half a millirem per hour. And so, yeah, and there's, there's different doses living in uh, Colorado, uh, you can have a place in Colorado where the uh, just the natural background radiation is twice that, you know, several hundred millirem more uh, up in Colorado than it is, um, you know, down, you know, down sea level, down where a lot of people live. And so that's because of the increased radiation from, you know, less atmosphere, less shielding from cosmic rays. But then yeah, you look at it, you know, people say, yeah, but everybody in Colorado is really healthy. You, you know, so you get you get that kind of dialogue going. But uh, if I go back to the, uh, the half millirem per hour on the, the plane, because I always, uh, always give our project manager a hard time. I tell her, well, you know, uh, uh, you're gonna get more radiation dose than any of us because you're gonna be flying to all these meetings. And, and uh, you know, and, and so if you look at what the limits are <laughs> and what realistically expect from all this ground testing and everything, that's that's actually, a, you know, that's a true statement, but it's, uh, uh, anyway, so that's a, a, a challenging one to discuss, but I'll just mention that uh, very encouraging that we have some, some very quantitative uh, guidelines. And then also a, a, a fission system, it's, it's essentially non-radioactive at launch. And I have to say essentially, you can look at it and you know, there is some radioactivity, but it's very, very low. So that's not, mm -hmm. um, so they're just inherently, they, that kind of gives an inherent advantage uh, for fission systems. Uh, both fission and radioisotope systems are designed to be extremely safe, but it's just one of the differences is that uh, just fission systems are essentially non-radioactive at launch. And so that helps a lot when we start looking at, well, what if you did have a, a failure of the launch vehicle or what if you know certain things happened uh, again it's uh, something that needs to be addressed but it will be straightforward to address for the fission systems uh, and you can have yeah, you can go online there's all kinds of other ones like how much radiation you get from eating bananas and and please don't think i'm saying don't eat bananas they're actually really good for us i've heard but it's just but just the <laughs> potassium 40 it's a natural <laughs> radioisotope in you know uh that uh you know gives us a certain amount of radiation and so it's uh it's a uh, you know, challenging, not that challenging. So actually a really fun subject yeah. to discuss, but it's just one that we have to be very clear about when we are discussing. Yeah. And living in brick houses in because of the affairs. radon that's in the clay and also there's all sorts of interesting oh. things like that as well. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And, yeah. Um, all, all kinds of different. Uh, yeah. I will, I will say yeah. that the highest, uh, the highest dose that's mentioned in those criteria is still actually lower than some areas of earth have natural background radiation per year. Uh, and so, yeah, just when you look at those, I'll say it's, um, I think it's, you're trying to stay, uh, you know, one in a million, I think it's below 25 rem in the NSPM uh, uh, 20. And there's a town in Iran, it's Ramsar, Iran, where they actually get 28 rem per year. So they get 28 per rem per year, just natural background. And so you look into it a little bit and they, they have, I guess they're like radium hot springs that they have in the town. And then you look at it and apparently the life expectancy there is is like in the 90s. I mean, it's just really, really healthy people live in there. And so so yeah. you could say, well, you know, maybe that's because of the the uh, high radiation levels. But it also could be that, you know, hey, you're living in a resort town, you know. And so a lot of, you know, I mean, so it's. Yeah, uh, the therapeutic so hot springs a, takes care of the radiation. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they, they maybe uh, yeah. You know, uh, counterbalance it or something. But anyway, so that's. Uh, um, yeah. But, it, you know, it is. It, it'll be a. Uh, It'll be a, a good discussion, but again, it's with the fission systems. You have the they're in inherently, uh, you, you know, they can be designed to be, uh, you know, just you know, very. I'll say inherently safe. That a lot of people don't like that word either. But you know, it's just starting out the fact that you're essentially non radioactive is a is a big help. Yeah, we um, as as you as you know, you know, aerospace has looked at uh, a number of those types of issues for like launch processing. Like you said, you know, uh -huh. where would you process this nuclear reactor engine right. in a launch vehicle or for a launch, even for the first flight item, whatever that looks like, right? And um, right. you know, the studies that aerospace has done is says you know that you know the, the facilities at Cape Kennedy, uh, Cape Canaveral, and 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 uh, Space Force Station are all capable of handling these things. So there's no, which, which is awesome. Uh, the other thing that we've also shown too, as you might, as you brought up, Mike, is that because these engines are essentially off, you know, that really helps 
the personnel safety working around this type of engine to get it ready for launch, right? And, and right. Um, it's actually, I think, in some cases, safer than working around these RTGs, you know, the ones that went to Pluto, uh, to Cassini and, and to Galileo. Um, and, uh, and the other thing that we're doing, just to let you know, and I'm, I think I've told you about this before, is that because aerospace is really big and, you know, one of our mantras is about mission assurance, right? And so we've taken and we're taking the mission assurance guidelines that we provide to our Space Force customers as well as any others, and we're tailoring those to accommodate a nuclear first flight whether or not it's okay. a first flight of a nuclear electric propulsion reactor or, or a nuclear thermal engine, but we're now starting to accommodate, you know, all these different changes. Oh, well, there's no LOX tank requirements, so what do we do in its place? You know, um, you know there, right. and, and making sure that we can, when the time comes for a first flight, that we have the process in place that we can hand to NASA or support NASA with on the mission assurance side to say, okay, we've already done all of the mission assurance tailoring um, and I know that the ones that you guys are looking at are the ones that we actually wrote for Space and Missile Center, you know, uh, over the past couple of years. So, uh -huh. you know, we're, we're, we're helping you with that part on the mission assurance and uh, launch protocols and things like that. Yeah, no, so, and I think that's that's fan that is fantastic, actually, because, again, we if we keep it just I'll say just quantitative, but from a standpoint of, yeah, we're, we're going to you know make sure we meet the established standards and it'll be a very uh, streamlined yep. launch approval process. You know, it won't be a. Uh, uh, but it's there's uh, we want to you know try to avoid any prescriptive regulation or things that you know in the past uh, really back in the 80s really had a negative impact on the nuclear industry from uh, really yeah. not just a reliability and a capacity factor standpoint even from a safety standpoint by trying to over prescribe we we're actually hurting things and so but I think you guys have you know everything I've seen uh, is is really trying to push us towards no just you know meet uh, NSPM 20 you know and and uh, yeah, but not in a prescriptive or an overly generic way. It's uh, and then just going back a little bit, you, you reminded me with uh, essentially non-radioactive. There's a kind of a famous picture from the Rover Nerva program, and it's the highest power reactor ever built. It's rated at five thousand megawatts thermal. Okay, so that was the Phoebus two A, and they're getting ready to, to go out to the test site, and there's a couple of technicians just sitting on the railroad car right next to the reactor, and so you know I think that picture is you know worth at least a thousand <laughs> words, and that it. It drives home that before these have been run, uh, they're essentially non-radioactive. Now, of course, after the engine's been run, the uh, you know the the energy is liberated by the uranium splitting, and those fission products tend to be neutron rich. And so, uh, just in the process of you know uh, them them basically trying to convert or converting neutrons into protons, so it's no longer a uh, you know, they're not neutron rich anymore. Well, that's how you get the radiation after the system's been run. But before the system's been run, it's mm -hmm. uh, again very. Uh, yeah, very mild uh, uh, radiation field. Yeah, um, just a couple of points just before I move on to the next topic I want to ask you about is, okay. um, you know, back in the NERVA days, you know, or even, you know, that was right around NERVA. That's when Apollo was, you know, was launching uh -huh. and then to yeah. the moon. But I think um, from what I recall, Stanley Gunn, if you remember Stan Gunn, right? He oh, was yeah. Yeah. one of the oh, original guy, project yeah. managers from Rocketdyne on, in NERVA. And, um, you know, 10 years ago when he was in his 90s, he had said, and I think this is also published, that you know they were looking at a nuclear-powered upper stage for the Saturn V launch vehicle. And uh -huh. um, had Apollo continued, that would have been the way they were going, is having a nuclear-powered upper stage because it would have enabled three times the payload mass to go to the moon over a conventional uh -huh. chemical-powered upper stage. And that's pretty, that's remarkable. I mean, just to, to think of what kind of a, capability that would afford. And then somebody had some crazy idea about this weird looking wind, winged thing called a space truck. And then, oh, this, let's give it, oh, it's, you mean like a space shuttle? And then, and then, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then Demi, yeah, De Apollo went away and everyone went on to the space truck bandwagon and, and the space, you know, the space shuttle was born. But had that nuclear project continued, you know, it's just one other example of even with the technology back then, you know, the capability of what nuclear propulsion provides in space is just extraordinary when you have that kind of efficiency. And so I wanted to kind of switch gears just a little bit because we've been talking about nuclear thermal propulsion mainly, but there's also the nuclear electric side, uh -huh. right? Which is where you have right. your power uh -huh. plant, you know, your, your heat source, um, nuclear reactor fission based, obviously. Uh, but now it's going to be running some kind of quote generator, right? Whatever it is that's going to take the heat of whatever propellant or working fluid is going through the reactor and converting it to electricity to run new, uh, you know, EP thrusters or science or anything like that. 
So how would you characterize the differences between like a nuclear thermal propulsion system and a nuclear electric propulsion system as, as far as capabilities and, and challenges, so to speak? I know that's a uh -huh. kind of a loaded question, <laughs> you know, because they oh, are yeah, dramatically yeah. different. But go ahead. Yeah, so, so they're both extremely useful. They're both, uh, they'll be really good when we, we get to the point where we have both systems. And, and I think you described it really well, the uh, nuclear thermal propulsion, if uh, you know, you're heating the propellant directly, and so all of the energy you know, from fission goes into the propellant, uh, but then you have to start looking at uh, you know, temperature limits on the materials, what kind of specific impulse you can get to with those temperature limits. Again, as we mentioned, uh, probably 900, maybe a little bit higher with a solid fuel system, uh, maybe up to 1800 seconds with a liquid fuel system, a little bit of work. That's one of the ones uh, universities seem to really like. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's a great system, but it's also got a lot of, a lot of potential uh, research topics obviously involved with it. And then, uh, and, you know, going beyond that, uh, with electric propulsion, the, energy is converted to electricity first as, as the name would imply and so that does introduce some you know basically I'll, I'll say uh well some of the heat isn't converted to electricity and so it needs to be rejected thermally because if you mm -hmm. I, I was going to use the word efficiency but i have to be careful how i say efficiency because when you get to the actual propellant well now the uh, specific impulse can really uh you know be almost as high as we want because they have various electric thrusters. And so, for example, with the, uh, like say a hall thruster, maybe 2,500 seconds specific impulse, kind of in that range. Uh, ion thruster can go mm -hmm. higher than that. There's a, uh, 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 Franklin Chang Diaz, a, a former astronaut. He's got his own company now down at in Houston. He's doing the uh, Vasimir. It's a, a variable specific mm -hmm. impulse. I, I believe in the past he talked about uh, specific impulse up to like 30,000 seconds. So you get a very efficient use of the propellant, but now the thrust is lower. So maybe one way to think about it is with nuclear thermal propulsion, you have high thrust, but you have these uh, potential thermal limits on your specific impulse. With electric propulsion, it's, it's low thrust, but you can really go to very high specific impulses. And so it really just depends on the mission, yeah, uh, the architecture that's being used. And you know, in some cases, the nuclear thermal propulsion is, is, is the preferred way to go. In other cases, nuclear electric propulsion is a preferred way to go. Uh, and so, uh, you know, so my, I just think, you know, we should have uh, both of them. It'd be really useful to have both of them developed. And then the, uh, and right. then of course, and then a third use of fission that uh, a lot of people, uh, uh, a lot of companies, I know, uh, uh, I think, well, I won't name names, but I think companies are on record saying that they could use, uh, you know, hundreds of kilowatts on the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars. I mean, maybe start mm -hmm. out in the tens sure. of kilowatts, but uh, if you start doing in situ resource utilization, any type of really using that, you need uh, you know a lot of electricity on the surface of the moon or Mars, and they all kind of tie together. Any any one of those three, yeah. You know, if I develop, uh, if I fly a nuclear thermal propulsion system first, well, just the experience, the everything from uh, not just the fuels, but again moderators, reflectors, control systems, launching, every everything involved with that. Yeah, uh, it's it would help fission surface power systems and nuclear electric propulsion systems. If I, uh, yeah, if I flew a fission surface power system first, it would help, you know, nuclear thermal propulsion and nuclear electric propulsion. But ideally we'll uh, right. get to the point where we have all, all three systems available for use. Yeah, that'd be nice. And the, the, the yeah. way that we've oh, always yeah. described it too is, um, you know, nuclear thermal propulsion, as you mentioned, it gives you the high thrust, right? High thrust right. gives you rapid travel time, right? As far as, uh -huh it can meet responsiveness requirements for things. You can move right. things very quickly. Whereas um, the electric propulsion, as we know, is, you know, really, really low thrust. And so it's going to take a long yeah. time to go from point A to point B, but you're doing it like super efficiently. So it is right. a trade-off. Right. And there's often, the, there's often the comparison too of uh, nuclear electric versus solar electric, where you just take the energy from the sun, uh -huh you know, convert that directly to electricity and power your electric thrusters, how is that better right. than nuclear, right? Because the nuclear right. electric systems have the power conversion. They also have the waste heat, which are you know, required giant radiators in some cases with different, perhaps different coolants and working fluids, but it's always on, right? You don't care right. whether or not you see the sun or not. So that's an advantage, right? So it's very mission, right. you mentioned this, it's very mission specific, <clears throat> excuse me, customer specific, you know, what they want to do with whatever they're putting in space. And, um, and to be able to do that, you know, uh, you know, whether or not they want the responsiveness aspects or not, you know, that's also something to consider. So yeah, it's but but you had mentioned about the common theme, right? And it seems to be the reactor, right, is 
Uh-huh. Is there a common reactor design that will, you know, is it one reactor fits all nuclear, thermal and nuclear electric? And of course, there's the bimodal nuclear engines from that Stan Borowski and a number of other colleagues have proposed many years ago about it. Can you use the same nuclear reactor in your nuclear thermal propulsion system to produce electricity when the engine's not making thrust? Right. So there's there's interest. There's there's combinations of there, too, which are all, you know, Super simple, right? <laughs> um, yeah. But one of the things, uh, and to see if you would, would, would you agree though? Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'll just say, uh, mm-hmm. what is your thoughts on um, the complexity of and the technical challenges associated with nuclear thermal versus nuclear electric? Because that's kind of a, a heated thing right now, no pun intended. Um, right. Yeah. Within, uh, within a number of communities of, Oh, the best way to get to Mars is nuclear electric. Oh, the best way to get to Mars is nuclear thermal, right? And so, you know, to kind of just focus on what, without one being better than the other, because I really don't think there is a better or worse. It's more right. of, in my mind, how quickly and affordably could we overcome the technical challenges and uh-huh. validate that they've been overcome through either flight test or ground test to enable a full-on operational mission for either one of these, right? So. I guess to all that shifts shifts into one que- you know the question I have is what would be the primary technical challenge you see for nuclear thermal and what would be the primary technical challenge you see for nuclear electric for given like a Mars mission okay well I think you know, one thing's want to go back uh, just a few seconds you mentioned uh, a lot of people now they're looking at what they call the advancement degree of difficulty and so it's an 80 oh, yes. squared and that's uh, particularly applicable to space nuclear power propulsion because, you know, we really, yeah, you, know, you can only get so much if you're going back. Some of these programs, as you mentioned, the Rover Nerva program, that's, a, you know, 50, 60 years old. You know, a lot of the technologies out there. Well, um, and even like uh, SP-100, that's 30 years old. That was an electric system. And so the, the TRL isn't really as applicable. It's really based on, okay, where we're at right. now, all of the advantage, all the advances we've had in, in just, nuclear technology in general, fission technology in general. Uh, but there's other things, you know, advanced in materials, uh, a lot of advanced in manufacturing, the additive manufacturing, uh, the interest in small terrestrial systems. So with all that put together, uh, really starting where we're at now, what has the the lowest advancement degree of difficulty? And that, that could be for each concept. Mm-hmm. So if I have a nuclear thermal propulsion system, okay, what, you know, what combination it gives me, you know, the adequate performance, but again, has the, uh, I guess you say the lowest advancement degree of difficulty. And then with uh, uh, nuclear electric propulsion, you know, it's kind of the same thing. There's different, uh, you know, reactors that could be coupled in, there's different power conversion systems, different radiators, you know, PMAD, what kind of thrusters do we couple to? Yeah, you know, looking at all that, mm-hmm. you know, based on, yeah, and it can even be what based on facilities that are available to, uh, to test. Yeah, you know, what gives the lowest uh, advancement degree of difficulty? And so, uh, so I, I hesitate to say what the biggest technical challenge will be because it it really almost want to look at it as an integrated uh, system for each one and say, okay, well, who's you know yeah. for that given approach, like that given approach to in TP, you know, you know, what are some things we could do in the next year or two? Because that's that's how a lot of people end up translating the eighty that's squared. Right. Okay, if you say you have a, it turns out with. 80 squared, again, this advancement degree of difficulty, the the lower, the better, which makes sense when you think of what the acronym means. So, so you want a low 80 squared. So, but say you just have what, you know, whatever people want to call say an acceptable 80 squared. Uh, well, a lot of people immediately say, okay, well then you should be able to show significant progress in the next year or two. You know, you know or, you know, what's your system? And then you should have a, you know, very significant steps or, or certainly within the next you know, two or three years, you know, just something to, to, to prove that you really do have this, this acceptable advancement degree of difficulty. And so I think uh, two things going on, a lot of people are talking about uh, optimizing the NTP system for a, a low AD squared. A lot of people are talking about optimizing the NEP system for a low AD squared. I think also there's mm-hmm. discussion about having, you know, really going back and looking at uh, architect, you know, pick a mission, say it's a human Mars mission and look at an architecture, but don't, don't pick like a generic, one size fits all architecture or not one size fits all just a generic architecture and then see uh how various technologies you know chemical non you know chemical nuclear anything can fit that one architecture go back and really say okay let's let's say if i was going to use nuclear electric propulsion uh let me optimize my architecture for using nuclear electric propulsion if i was going to use nuclear thermal propulsion uh let me optimize the architecture for nuclear thermal propulsion and so so that also leads to different systems and then um and then what's what's really important 
in that architecture. A lot of times for human Mars missions, people talk uh, trip time. Uh, there's some discussion now mm -hmm. about saying, okay, let's, uh, you know, what, what, what trip time would it take for the U S to really commit to a human Mars mission? And these are all, you know, just, this is just conversation that's floating around, you know, in the community. So it's, uh, sure. uh, but you know, you know, people will say, well, maybe, um, you know, maybe, maybe if we get close to our experience on space station, so, but we have about 12, 12 months, 10 people on station for 12 months. Well, you know, if we could do a, uh, you know, round trip mission to Mars in 12 months, you know, would the U S, uh, you know, be, would that be something, would that be enough to really encourage the U S to, to, to do human mission? Well, you know, again, you know, uh, five people in the room, you'll have six different opinions. And so it's not, you know, there's not a, a definite answer there, but it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's just talk like that. So I think, uh, orbit, from an orbital mechanic standpoint, a lot of people think, well, maybe we could get down into this like 420, 450 day range and still have say 60 days in Mars vicinity. Well, you, you know, again, is that enough? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, uh, that's just, that's kind of where the discussion right. is like, what's the, what's the real metric. So, uh, because no one wants to develop a system that isn't at least going to have the chance of being used, you know, so we could develop a, you know, pick a very easy to develop system, but if it takes, you know, if it doesn't give a, a trip time advantage or, uh, or safety advantage or some other advantage, then, you know, no one's going to use it anyway. So it's uh, what do we really need to develop? So anyway, all those uh, discussions are going on now. I have to see how those play out over the next, you know, several months, uh, but it's, uh, uh, but I think that's, that's kind of where we're at now. So I, again, uh, I, I was sort of dodging your question, but I didn't mean to completely. It's really just looking at that integrated system, the integrated NEP, what gives me the lowest AD squared that still has this exciting performance potential and uh, NTP, same thing. What would be the, the uh, lowest AD squared that still gives me the, again, the performance potential that, that would result in a system that we might actually use. Right. And, and yeah, I should also mention, I was looking at it too. Yeah, and that's very NASA centric. What I, I just said. Obviously, the other agencies yeah. <laughs> have you know other other requirements and other things that they're most interested in. But just from a NASA, and it's really even beyond NASA centric. It's more just human Mars centric. You know, if someone. Sure. Uh, I know you're yeah. a fan of human Mars missions. I, I like all space missions, but I'd love to see us do a human Mars mission. And so it's yeah. So that answer was kind of centric to that. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mike. Um, and I was expecting that kind of response. <laughs> um, oh, great. You know, okay. Especially because I mentioned that about the new, you know, the, the Mars mission and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, kind of the way that we've been looking at this too, from an NTP versus an NEP standpoint for, you know, doesn't really matter what the mission, but, you know, a nuclear thermal propulsion system looks extraordinarily like a traditional rocket engine, right? It has inlets, it has a nozzle, it has a big thing in the middle with pumps on it. And we understand a lot about that technology, everything around the reactor, I'm not saying we don't understand the reactor, but you know, there's options for how to design the reactor based on the known physics that you had mentioned, right? There, but we do know right, pumps, yeah. we know valves, we know lines, we know all those different challenges. For a nuclear electric system, there's all sorts of seemingly unknowns in there because you mentioned, and you hit the two words right on the head, system integration, right? We, uh -huh. you know, we have to think about this more than just the reactor. It has to be reactor coupled to power generation system. How is that cooled? Waste heat requirement. How do you condition the power? What do you do in between the reactor? You know, where, where you need the electric propulsion or not? You know, what do you do with all that waste energy, waste heat? There's a lot of different other subsystems that all have their own level of development requirements and capabilities that we don't really understand yet. You know, we have them at the kind of the thesis, you know, university level maybe and with a couple demonstrations here and there. But there's a lot more AD squareds to consider for a nuclear electric system rather than just the straight up componentry and AD squareds for a nuclear thermal system, right? It's, it just seems that, you know, just from the familiarity of nuclear thermal compared to nuclear electric. So, um, and then I also wanted to mention too about, you know, folks like DARPA that you mentioned, and there's others that are interested where they just want to do, you know, different missions within the solar system, within the Earth centric orbit. NEP may be their best way, NTP may there may be better. Um, but yeah, there's there's all sorts of different, and then you have to consider launch mass and what are you pushing in space, where are you pushing it, and how long is it gonna be? All those things that you you, you know you touched on as well. So um, I do want to just kind of wrap up uh, with one one final question, you know, just as an open discussion. And you and I again are part of the nuclear and future flight propulsion oh, technical yeah, yeah. committee. <laughs> yeah. So where do you see the future of nuclear propulsion or power going? Like, you know, let's say we do our Mars mission in 2035, 2039, somewhere in that time frame. you know, 
Where do you see it going after that if we have a successful mission to demonstrate nuclear power or propulsion in space? Where would you see the technology heading in, say, 50 years? Okay. So uh, I think an analogy I like to use on that one is the, uh, yeah, the uh, yeah, of course, the Wright brothers flew an airplane. Uh, but then the a lot of people would say the DC-3 was the first really useful plane. I mean, uh, there's still DC-3s flying today, which I find amazing. I mean, they were, I think they were from the 30s. <laughs> but it was just, uh, it could do things that you couldn't really do any other way. You know, just uh, transcontinental flights, transatlantic flights. Uh, you know, you could do, uh, uh, just had a lot of capability. And so I think some of these early systems, some of the traditional NTP systems that we'll, we'll use for human Mars or we'll use for operations in cislunar space, uh, to me, they'll be kind of like the DC-3, very, you know, very solid, uh, I guess that's a pun, uh, but, you know, you're very, uh, yeah, just a very uh, useful system, you know, a lot of applications. But uh, also to remember, though, it was only 29 years to go from the DC-3 to the SR-71. And so with fission, going back to really start, you know, when we first started talking, just with this energy density, which is some of the uh, fundamental attributes of a fission system, uh, we had that same kind of uh, you know, growth potential or, or increase in performance potential. And so, uh, again, I, I think uh, there are, you know, pretty reasonable concepts out there where you can uh, really use almost any volatile as a propellant. You can use it directly. They they solve the materials compatibility problems by, by really, uh, a lot of these would, again, go to, say, a liquid fuel concept with fission that can still be a very low mm. mass system, but you eliminate a lot of these uh, uh, potential compatibility problems with, uh various propellants. Well, then all of a sudden, if I can not only use hydrogen propellant, but I can use ammonia and water and methane and, and maybe get to the point where any mm. volatile that I find anywhere in the solar system, I can use as a propellant in this fission system. Well, that's, you know, that's when you're starting to move towards the SR-71. Now, you know, again, 29 years from the DC-3 to the SR-71, a lot of really, really smart people with really good budgets, you know, making that happen. So it's not a, you know, we're, we're going to go to Mars and, hey, you know, magically 29 years later, we're you know, going all over the solar system using ISRU propellants and everything else. But it's, uh, I think it really is about that, that same type of uh, a growth potential, that same kind of uh, a potential future. But the, really the key is to start start using these systems. Uh, again, I'm working right now, of course, uh, uh, more with the propulsion systems, uh, but you know, also uh, the surface power systems also be very useful. And any, even a, uh, uh, a power, a fission power system, or a fission propulsion system would really help, you know, get us on this path. You know, get us to that DC three. That then, uh, once people get uh, used to using fission systems, they start seeing the uh, potential of the systems. Uh, you know, frankly, get you know, excited about all the options, opportunities for using those, and that allows us to really get on that that growth curve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And um, you know, before we wrap up here, I guess you know one other wrench that'll get thrown into this works hopefully is yeah. the advent and the upcoming technology for fusion, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of possibility yeah. there that uh, maybe in the maybe in the future that you you'll be uh, you know yeah. the lead technical program or program manager of a fusion program from Marshall. But yeah. um, no, yeah, that's all part of our, if, our technical uh, committee discussions, yeah. right? And you know those types yeah. of systems seem to offer the same types of potential, right? For for um, you know interplanetary travel and power sources. Yeah. So that that'll be yeah, really and interesting that's the, to see. That's the key. Like like you say, if we can get the physics, it's a lot. Of, you know, might be a physics yeah. breakthrough, or but just somehow get the physics, whatever that ends up being. Uh, then yeah, the same thing. You're you're tapping into nuclear energy, and uh, uh, if we can you know get the uh, basically the the uh, fusion with a Q greater than one, basically meaning uh, a lot more energy out than in to make the reaction work, then it, it seems like they have a f fantastic potential also. So that's a good point. Uh, uh, but, absolutely. but fusion can do a, do a lot too. And between the two of them, uh, boy, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I agree. Well, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time today to talk with to talk with us and uh, for being on the show. Uh, it was a pleasure having yeah, you. My, pleasure my talking. Pleasure. And yeah. you were, you know, you know, I'm sure we could keep going for a long time on this topic. Oh, yeah. But uh, once again, thank you very yeah. much. And um, I'll turn it back over to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Yeah. Th and thanks. Thanks so much for having me again, Greg. It's always uh, always fun talking. So appreciate it. Bye bye now. Thank you to Greg and Michael for that discussion. Remember, this and previous episodes are also available as a podcast, or you can go to our website and click to browse all our episodes on science and technology. And thanks to our wonderful production team, Colleen Stover, James Liggins, and Jordan Bingham. Check us out on Twitter using hashtag the Space Policy Show and sign up for our latest news and alerts at aerospace.org slash policy. And be sure to look for our podcasts and share your favorite episodes with colleagues.
Stay tuned for more to come on the Space Policy Show. Next week, we'll have a panel of experts discussing partnerships between national labs and academia with our own Dave Miller. Until then, take care.